be in Matthew chapter 26 this morning. Before we go there, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are, uh, no matter what our motivations for being here, one thing is for sure that we're here. And however we got here, we can acknowledge the fact that there are many people here from many different backgrounds, going through many different things, and who are feeling all sorts of ways who are coming for all sorts of reasons, but we're here. Lord, what is more important and what is fascinating and awe-inspiring is that you are here. And Jesus, we could take it even a step further. And we can confidently say that you are delighted to be here. Father, that you are smiling upon us. And that if words do come by the power of your Holy Spirit, they are not going to be words of condemnation, assumption, prejudice, superficial, but they will be deeply kind and curious, honoring who we are right now. You are so patient with us. You don't move us along faster than we can handle. You are tender. And at the right time, you sometimes give us a nudge and even when we buck up and become angry with you, you are strong and you can contain us. You can handle us without leaving. Thank you. I want to acknowledge that you are here and because of Christ that you are kind. And Holy Spirit, I just want to ask you if you would continue to work in our hearts. Do the things that we could never do. Give us eyes to see how you're moving. Give us ears to hear how you're speaking and what you're saying. Help us to name and acknowledge the movements of providence in our lives and give us the strength to embrace those things with care but also with redemptive eyes. Be with us. Protect us from the evil one. As your word says that he comes as we sow the word of God to snatch that word away. Lord, till the ground of our hearts this morning so that the seed of your word, the gospel of Jesus Christ, would sink deeply and hide itself within our hearts to do that magnificent work called the kingdom of God. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to talk about joy and sorrow today. And we're going to talk about it from the passage of Matthew 26. Many of you are acquainted with the passage. It's the passage where Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's right before he's going to go through his passion, his suffering, his death, his betrayal. And right before that, he goes into this garden. Gethsemane means olive press. In other words, it's a place where he is so pressed that 
when he sweats, it actually becomes blood. Whatever our Savior is going through, it's very difficult. And what I want to do is I'd like to look at this passage through the lens of joy and sorrow. Because joy and sorrow are a deep, significant part of every single person in this room. But I don't know if we in this room are able to see it and name it. This is sorrow. This is joy. And to be able to embrace it as what's going on. And so let me give you an example of what joy and sorrow looks like. And so my three smallest children are in New Orleans because I had a, w- a wedding to preach yesterday. And it's a wedding of a good friend. And so my wife and I are helping the bride and the groom um, all day yesterday. So we take the three little ones, ship them off to New Orleans. The two oldest ones are around. My oldest one, Emma, she's in the wedding. And my little boy is with me, Jude. He's eight. And there's nothing he loves more than man time and to just be with dad. And so he knows that I'm coming to Jackson. All week long he knows I'm coming to Jackson. And he's like, Daddy, can I go to Jackson with you? Daddy, can I go to Jackson with you? And I'm like, why do you want to go to Jackson with me? Because I'm with you. And I'm like, sure, you can go to Jackson with me. And the elation. Yesterday he's like, Daddy, you know what today is, right? I'm like, yeah, it's it's Catherine and Luke's wedding. No, it's Jackson. He's like, you know what happens after the wedding, right? The reception where you love to dance and take the stage? Jackson, Dad. And so he's so excited. Well, Katie and I are in the car driving. And Emma and Jude are in the back. And Katie goes, all right, Jude, you're the, uh, the lady from camp last week just called. And the play that you're in tomorrow, you, she's making practice two hours early. And so instead of getting, being home at 4, you've got to be home at 2.30. And he begins to compute in his head what that means. Like, I live in Mobile. It's 11.50 right now. If I leave at 1, I'm not getting back till 4 at best. And he's doing the mathematics. And he goes, wait a, wait a minute. Like, does this mean I can't go to Jackson? And he's starting to crack in his voice. And my heart is just turning inside because I know what this means. And there's nothing we can do about it. What he deeply longs for, to be with Dad and Jackson, and the circumstance of life are now being ripped apart in his heart. And it's so tense, so significant, that it's forcing tears out of his eyes. And he's like, but Dad, can you... Can, can we just drive to Jackson tonight? You drive me back in the morning, go back and preach, and then drive me back. And we're like, no, that's irrational. Well, that, that, you, know, you can't imagine a different scenario, right? We, we all of a sudden, when sorrow comes into our lives, we move off into la-la land. Flip through Facebook into an imaginary world where the grass is greener on the other side. If this scenario were true, I would not be hurting like I am. Or when Emma says, well, Dad, can I go with you? Stop, Emma. You know, it's like anger, right? It's, and I'm like, Emma, don't go there because I know how tempting anger is. And so the tendency of a heart going through tremendous sorrow to evade the sorrow into a world of anger or a world of lust is so tempting. But I'm like, Jude, you've got to stay present. And I said, what are you going to do with your sorrow? What are you going to do with it? I said, Jude, one other time when he was experiencing sorrow, I said, Jude, sorrow is the shovel that God uses to dig a huge cavity in your heart so that the hole in your heart can embrace more joy in the future. Sorrow for tonight. Joy comes in the morning. I said, Jude, if you can have a little bit of sorrow, you'll have a little bit of joy. But if you can embrace the sorrow and let it do its work, you'll have a lot of joy. And so last night, I just caught myself talking to Katie. I'm like, I wonder if I can take him fishing Monday. I'll take a half a day off and we'll go fishing on Monday because that's all he wants to do all the time is, Daddy, can we go fishing? Can we go out? 
And I'm just imagining what he's going to say when I choose, when he knows Daddy chose to take a day off and say, Jude, can we go? And so sorrow ripped it apart. And then I'm hoping and I'm praying that when I give him these words that we're going to go fishing, the, the desire and the circumstance will match back up again. And you know what that's called? Joy. Joy and sorrow. And so how we deal with joy and sorrow means everything in our world. And so I want to show us, I want to go into this passage, I want to look how our Savior dealt with joy and sorrow. So let's read it together. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. When Jesus went with them to a place, then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And He said to His disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with Him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, He began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to his disciples, to the disciples, and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. What I want to do here is I want to take a look at how Jesus dealt with sorrow. How he dealt with the fact that his circumstance, his great and deep desire, and his circumstance were being ripped apart. You know what the hour at hand is, right? It's the crucifixion. It's when He would be betrayed. It's when He would, be able, would not be able to look into the eyes of anyone and they'd be glad to see Him. It's the deep desire of His heart not being met with any circumstance in the world. And as the hour draws near, the chasm is getting greater and greater. How would you handle this situation? Like, let's, let's just say that somebody came up to you and said, hey, tomorrow you're going to die. Not only are you going to die, but everyone that you know and love is going to betray you. Someone that you've spent years with is going to come up to you. They're going to kiss you on the cheek. But that's just a signal. For the soldiers to come in, take you captive, strip you naked, spit on your face, expose you to open shame, whip your back with cords, hang you from a cross to where you suffocate to death in massive pain, and you're going to scream, my God, why have you forsaken me? What if that was on your calendar for tomorrow? How would you respond? That is a sorrowful event. What does he say? He takes the disciples and he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful and troubled. The first thing he does is that we can't miss it here, is that he gets his friends around him. He wants to be around his friends. This isn't Jesus, the good pastor who read the pastoral handbook of 20 B.C. and said, okay, in order to do suffering well, a good pastor needs to have friends around him. They need to have a dinner, and then they need to have communion at that dinner. And then they need to sing a hymn, and so that he'll do what is pleasing to God. No, this is what his heart's desire was. He wanted to be around people. He wanted to be able to look into Peter's face 
and watch Peter look back at him. He wanted to feel John's body recline against him at the Last Supper. Because he knew it's just a matter of time when I will not be able to feel his body again. He wanted to be able to be with these folks and do something that, was, that felt unifying, like eating together, tasting good food, having wine, or having something that pro- provokes the senses and makes your senses go and you're, you're relaxing with one another. Look at verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, What do you imagine the Savior's voice was like the day before He was about to undergo the crucifixion? Do you think He was like, what song do you want to sing? No, He was like, let's sing the song that signifies that all of us are together. And I bet, oh my, what would His voice have sounded like coming so deep from His gut? And He just wanted to sing with them. Do you know why? Because singing with people for a moment, it says you're with me. We're on the same page. We're together in this. And so he longed for human connection. He longed for the eyes of another image bearer that reminded him of the Trinitarian enjoyment that he had with his Father. Don't you know that's what we're created for? Don't you know it's deeply Trinitarian that when you walk in here and you smile at me, I smile back? Don't you know it's deeply Trinitarian when I see you and I, my body just says, I'm glad to see you, and you respond, I'm glad to see you. Or when you walk in, daddies, when you walk home, when you go inside the house and your 15-month-old, mine is Audrey, she just screams to the top of her lungs, Dad, Dad! And if she's in anybody's arms, she lets go of their arms and reaches to me. And then what I do when I walk in is I think, okay, in seminary, I read a parenting guide. And that means that a child needs my attunement. And, 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 and I'm going to give my attunement to her, right? No, that's not what I do. It's naturally woven into the fabric of this image of God right here that when my little girl looks at me and lights up, something inside of me lights up back. And she needs that. I need that. Dada, Audrey, I'm happy to see you. I'm so glad to see you. And everything in our body communicates I want to be with you. I want to be close to you. Jesus was like that. He wanted to be with His disciples. He wanted that connection. I'm glad to be with you. And so He ate with them. He sang a song. Simple things. Then, He begins to communicate with them. He takes a few, he tells that group, look, one of you is going to betray me. How painful to even just articulate it without getting angry or lustful. Can you imagine what it was like for Jesus to look Judas in the eyes in the upper room? Most of us in this room would probably not even look at him knowing what he was about to do to us. But Jesus, can you hear this? Jesus wanted to be with all of His disciples. While knowing He was going to get betrayal from His disciples. But then He begins to communicate. He takes three into Gethsemane. And the Bible says He began to be sorrowful and troubled. And listen to this, verse 38. And then He said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here. Remain here and watch with me. And what I want you to hear here is how hard is it to articulate what's going on in your chest? Have you ever had somebody saying, what you, not how are you doing? I'm going to challenge everyone in this room. Stop saying how are you doing. It's not a good question. How about this? What are you feeling? How did today make you feel? What are you feeling right now? And watch people just stumble. Watch us stumble over our words. We have no idea how to express how we're feeling. When we get a little dysregulated, you're like, what's wrong? And the best 
the best articulation of what we've got probably is I'm frustrated, right? And what frustrated means is I have no idea what's going on in here, but I can't control it. Get away, right? <laughs> Watch out. Because whatever's going on here, it's certainly not my fault, it's yours. That's what frustrated means. But, but the question that I have is, when what you deeply desire and the circumstance doesn't provide what you desire, I wonder if it would be good for all of us to learn how to say this, my soul is sorrowful right now. And how vulnerable is that communication to someone that you're close to. When is the last time you've articulated that to somebody you know? My soul is sorrowful right now. Before looking at this passage, I'd never said that. Ever. After this passage, I say it like 20 times a day. <laughs> Katie's like, stop it already. <laughs> like, stop. Here we go again. Scott's got a new word that he's saying all the time, right? <laughs> but how important it is for us to be able to articulate with our mouths. Jesus was spot on with what was going on in his heart. I'm sorrowful right now. And then listen, can you remain here and watch with me while I'm sorrowful? Notice he didn't say, take my sorrow away. He didn't say that. He didn't say, become what I need in order to make this sorrow go away. He didn't say that. He says, remain here with me and watch with me. Watch me squirm. Watch me fall. Watch me bleed. Watch me. Remain here with me. Don't enter into temptation. Do you know why Jesus doesn't want you to enter into temptation? Because temptation is you looking away from Him and He wants you looking at Him. Temptation is an evil distraction uh, of, of the enemy to get you looking away from your savior, savior. And Jesus, what He's saying is don't go into temptation. It's not because He... He doesn't want you to do wrong. He wants you to look at Him. He wants you to say, Dad. So He can look at you and say your name back and be glad to be with you. So He stayed present in the bind. And the bind is very important to understand. I'm going to use the word bind to articulate being with people that brought Him joy and sorrow without leaving. And by leaving, I mean becoming lustful or angry. Watch what he does with Peter. He says, will you remain here and watch with me? And then look at verse 40. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? I desire that you just be with me at the deepest, darkest night of my life. Can you imagine your best friend or your spouse about to undergo the deepest, darkest part of their life and all they want you to do is to just sit with them for an hour and you nod off? What are they going to say to you? Wake up and just be with me. Can you just be with me and not fall asleep? Jesus was like, could you just not be? What He longed for and what He had wasn't the same thing. He longed for a person to be with Him and the person fell asleep. He longed for the unity of humanity. And what He got was the diversity. What He got was the frailty. What He got was the human frailty of Peter and the rest of the disciples. At best... At worst, he got the fact that they just didn't see him or didn't even care as much as they should have. But he stayed present. He didn't go off on a temp temper tantrum. He didn't say, won't you make this moment what I need it to be? And he didn't go off into la-la land and think, man, I wish Peter would be something different. There's a great balance our Savior has by honoring you where you are and desiring where He knows you can be. But He honored them where they were. You're tired. I understand that. Can you watch with me? You're tired. Okay. Can you watch with me? He stayed in the bond. He had the ability to stay in the bond and look at another person, even Judas, knowing that he was going to betray him. Look, my betrayer is at hand. And if you read how he converses with Judas, he was even kind to him then. Right? 
I mean, compared to what we would have done. I would have been like, go ahead, man. <laughs> Don't kiss me. Don't you dare get close to me. I know what you're about to do. Just let them take me. Don't get close to me. But I wonder if there wasn't something in Jesus just going, please let it be another way. And right up until the point where the kiss happened. And here's the thing, we all desire to be in one unison with each other. We all desire to be in relationship with one another, to be in joyful relationship with one another, to be in that Trinitarian union where we're attuning with one another. I see you, you see me, you're glad to see me, let's go conquer the world, right? I see you, you see me, I'm glad to be with you, you're glad to be with me, let there be light in a dark place. I see you, you see me, you're glad to be with me, I'm glad to be with you, we're going in the same direction. Let that which is formless become formed. Let that which is void become voidless and, and have stars and suns and moons. It's part of our nature as image bearers to want to be with another image bearer and to create out of that joy. It's the reason why when women get together in a room and they decorate after it, they look at it and they're like, sweet. You know, it's like I, I watched it happen the other day. This, that, it, it was great. It was the wedding reception and they, they took the reception hall and they made it from this bland room into this magnificent creation. And all the ladies who were on that team, just they were like, you know, they're like clapping. And I was like, joy, joy in creation. And they're like, here we go again. Scott talking about joy, right? But it's so true. It's deeply woven into the fabric of our being. But here's the bind. You're like me, but you're not like me. Will, you, will, will our relationship be full of beauty? Or betrayal. I'm not sure because this world's fallen. Or it's going to be a mixture of both. And so I'm intrigued, but I'm scared. Will it bring me delight? Or are you going to bring me disaster? Is your, is your difference going to bring danger to me? Or delight in me? And can I ask these questions without controlling you? Can I ask these questions without taking control? Can I go to the Father and say, not my will, which is to control you, but yours. Take my hands away. Let Him kiss me. And if we are unwilling to enter into that bind by looking at the unity and diversity in other people, then we are going to look at people either as individuals or as groups and say, you know what, I'm not glad to be with you. The fear that I have inside trumps the love that I have for joy. And can I say this? That is the heart of racism. You can't deal with racism if you don't deal with joy. Did you know that? Moral obligations won't deal with racism. Paternalistic agendas won't deal with racism. Having a guilty conscience won't deal with racism. None of that will deal with racism. Do you know how to deal with racism? Simeon talking to me about how African Americans are taking horses and making them beautiful. I grew up on a farm. The only people that I know how to know that I know that make horses beautiful are white people. And I am totally intrigued. And I'm opening myself up to the beauty of horses in the woods. I mean, like who keeps horses in woods? Well, they do. And they're like world class apparently. Like I'm curious about it. Or what about the guys in my neighborhood? That everybody in society says, you know what, they're no, they're no good. But he came to my house at 11.30 at night when somebody was beating on my door angry. 
Most of us in this room would call the police. Hey, man, you got somebody angry at your door? Yeah, I do. Can you come over here? No, man, you got to call the police. <laughs> you know? he, he didn't say that. He said, I'm a, I'll be right there. Now, how beautiful is that? If we are not willing... See, here's the deal. Race is an invitation into the bind. Did you know that? You are a personal invitation for creativity and beauty and joy. And so when I see you and the color of your skin, I see eyes, we're, 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 we're together. And then I see that your skin is different than mine. I'm like, wait a minute, you're different. It's beautiful. And all of a sudden, that beauty makes desire well up into my heart that I don't know what to do with it. Because I'm like, wait a minute, that's beautiful. What can we create? What, what can we create? Wait a minute. But the last time I opened myself up to creation, I got betrayal. Wait a minute. I'm afraid of you. And in order to kill that desire, I've got to hate you. Racism. Race is the invitation. Come. See my diversity as beauty. Take the invitation to beauty and let's create together. Like all, all great movements where races come, to, to come together create beautiful things. Racism says no to the invitation. It's the denial of the invitation. Racism is the paralyzation of creativity and the refusal to find joy in the diversity of another. It's the refusal to even be curious about the beauty in the diversity of another. But what if Jesus takes the fear away? What if Jesus makes it to where I can open myself up to you and you might betray me, but I won't die? I'll make myself vulnerable regardless of if you make yourself vulnerable or not and we can have an interaction because I know that the Holy Spirit that's working in me doesn't regard people as their person. I mean, he no respect to a person. So you and I can come together and create something like let there be light. And you know what? I'm wondering what the enemy is so afraid of to where he is relentlessly keeping us tied up into racial wickedness. What is he so afraid that we might create together if we would be vulnerable with one another? Hey, when I speak to you this way, does it offend you? I'm curious. I personally didn't know that a person, the familial beauty of your culture to where when someone is killed in Minnesota, you feel it in Mississippi. I didn't know that. That's beautiful. And I'm sorry I don't feel it, but I'm hoping that I can. And the beauty that's been created in repentance. But you'll notice that while Jesus was in the bind with the people, He did not lay upon them the burden to fulfill His desires. Racism places the burden on the other to fulfill desires. Either you got to go or you got to shape up, whatever it is, you got to, you got to change so that my desires might be met. Jesus never did that with His disciples. All He said is remain here and watch with me. I do it all the time in marriage. I'm like, I'm sorrowful. You've got to get my sorrow away. <laughs> I'm sad right now. I'm depressed. You've got to be the one to bring the words. And my wife looked at me the other day and was like, you're trying to make me take your sorrow away, and I can't. And I'm like, stop pastoring me. <laughs> it, it didn't make me less angry at the time. Look, it didn't. <laughs> As I, I, was, I was like, look, I just need a minute to to regulate. I need a minute. And as I, as I was taking big deep breaths, you know, 
I was like, man, I think, I think she's right. <laughs> and she was. And so Jesus looked to his friends for support, but he relied upon his father for satisfaction. Look at how he prays. My father, if this cup can be taken from me, please let it be so, but not my will, but your will. And that my father is a, is a guttural, desperate child. He didn't fall on his face because it was the proper thing to do. He fell on his face because his sorrow took him to the ground. And it wasn't this religious, reverent prayer like, Oh, Holy Father, You are sovereign and providential, which is a good prayer. And it wasn't, Lord, I thank You that in the past Your steadfast love has been this and been this. It's been those prayers in the middle that we all experience throughout the day where how long, O oh Lord, are You going to forget me? How long are You going to allow my enemies to triumph over me? Will You please not allow my betrayer to come right now and rip my body apart? Will You do that? But if not, Your will be done, not mine. I surrender myself to You as hard as that might be. And we've got to pray like that. It'll, it, it does some good to get into your closet and pray sometimes. Not because that's what you're supposed to do, but because that's, that's who you really are. If you're not praying to God how you argue with your friend, you might not be praying. People sometimes come to me and they tell me everything. And they're like, what do I do? And I'm like, why don't you go tell God everything you just told me the same way you told me? And Jesus did that. He wrestled with His Father. He prayed for a long time. The disciples had time to fall asleep. The angels had time to come and minister to Him, as Luke tells us. He had time to begin to rest in His Father's will. Every time He asked His Father, if you'll look at it, it seems more restful, more surrendered. Here's what I want you to understand, though, is that prayer did not change His circumstance. He still underwent the hour. But Luke tells us something pretty amazing. After he prayed, my father, the father sent angels to minister to him. And I'm like, so? He still died. Like he still had, had to drink the cup of God's wrath. What did the angels do? And right after Luke tells you that the angels ministered to him and strengthened him, it said that he became more distressed and his sweat became as drops of blood. And so what that tells me is if, if we will wrestle in our sorrow with the Father, and if we will honestly communicate with Him in prayer with the Father long enough, angels will come and minister to us. And it won't change our circumstance. It will allow us to grow deeper into the sorrow. It will allow us to feel the sorrow more without leaving. It will allow us to take the shovel and dig a bigger hole with sorrow. That's what the angels did. That was the strength that the angels gave to Jesus. It allowed Him not to escape His circumstance, but to dig deeper into the sorrow. To feel the desires more. Look, we are desperately afraid of desire. Everybody in this room. Once sorrow just starts pricking your heart a little bit, it's like, is there a snack in the cupboard? <laughs> My circumstance doesn't line up with what I desire. Who is giving me an email? You know, it's like, or at best, I can't believe they're not doing something. It's like, we can't handle it. But what if we were to sit in silence and say, my soul is sorrowful. Call somebody. My soul is sorrowful. Can you just rest and, and sit and pray with me? Can you sit with me while I grow in my sorrow and wait for Him to take it away? That's what Jesus did. And His sorrow allowed Him... Are you ready? Here, here's the end. His sorrow allowed Him to deepen His desire. 
to where his desire went from his immediate desire to his ultimate desire. At some point, Jesus got up from praying. And it was when his immediate desire to forego the crucifixion was replaced with his ultimate desire. Now, what was that? We all do this. We, in athletics, you know, we go through great trial and tribulation during practice. Those immediate desires we forego, the, the immediate desires of, of comfort and of not throwing up after running sprints and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And we're, we're, we're foregoing those immediate desires. Why? So that we can have the ultimate desire of the championship. When you fast food, you forego the immediate desire for food in order that your heart might grow in your ultimate desire for God. What was his ultimate desire? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What was it? What was it when he was being tempted, come off the cross if you're God? What was it that when he got those words, he gritted his teeth and says, I'm not coming down. What was it that he was holding on to that made him stay on the cross? What was it that he was holding on to that made that, that, where he was saying in his heart, if I get angry right now, if I leave this situation right now, I can't have what I'm looking to. What was the ultimate desire? What was the joy? And we have to know why he went to the cross to take down the wall. To take down the wall so that, you know, he, so that he, he could have you. You know, my, my favorite times as a dad are when I go into my little girl's room when she's just waking up, or when I get to wake her up. It's Camille, she's six. And she's sleeping peacefully. And I'll sit there and I'll just look at her. And the, and the joy that I feel when I take my hand and place it on her cheek and she doesn't even open her eyes before she takes her arm, wraps it around my neck and pulls me close. She's half awake. And all she wants is me to be close. Right? Right? All of us in this room, before we were saved, we didn't want Him close. And He was sitting with us, longing for our connection, longing for us to just say, come close. And we wouldn't do it. But He underwent the cross to remove the dividing wall so that our hearts might be liberated and so that did you know that before you came here this morning, He was excited to see you. Jesus was watching you while you sleep. One of my friends says He nudges the host of heaven saying, that's my little girl. That's my boy. Wait till they wake up and come together. Wait till they look at one another and just start saying, I'm so glad to be with you. You watch what they're going to create. And you better bet the gates of hell, hell aren't going to prevail against them. He did it. He did all of it. The joy that was set before Him was you looking at Him and saying, Lord, I love you. The connection. The attunement. The arms out wide saying, Daddy, that's why He did it. That's the Gospel. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we pray that You would answer our prayers to be able to recognize joy and sorrow, to be able to stay present when we experience those things. Father, that we might be curious about one another and be able to name when we feel joy when we see one another and do life with one another and create with one another and give praise to you as we stand upon the neck of our adversary Jesus 
thank you. It's in your name that we pray these things. Amen.